it's things like punctuality big issues for us. You know, you know, a business partner of mine at the biggest company was not us, and he was um, was a labor lawyer. He was a labor lawyer who represented Monsieur Laporte at the Dalmas Treason trial. And he said, you know, this thing about Ubuntu, there's also Ubuntu time. Because you never get to meetings on time, because you must have a chat and find out how's your family before we can start the meeting. It's cultural differences. So, you know, it's, it went really deep. Smokers, where you ate lunch, made a difference. But the amazing thing was that people all shared the same history. We were supposed to be in a democratic, free society, but our issues were so deep, pretty, pretty really deep. And why is it that we can't get rid of those issues? Why do we hang on to them? And so, I was looking for a way out. And I want to say looking for a solution, because when you're in that kind of situation, you want a way out. You want to escape, man. You want to fix this. You want to exit. So, if that psychologist came and said, guys, pack up and leave. Yeah, sure, okay, thanks. You know? But there are options available. There's revenge, which we practice. I'll do something and you'll do something and then you'll do something back to me. You know, but it cuts both ways and it's a cyclic thing. It just carries on forever. So revenge doesn't fix anything. It doesn't even give you a way out. There's also amnesty. The problem with that amnesty creates amnesia. I'll just forget about it. Let it go. But the possibility of re-victimization will, will occur again because we haven't dealt with the issues. Of course, there's justice. By justice, I mean by trial. You reverse that. Sit down, argue your case, make it valid, put forward the facts and the truths, etc., and have a trial by jury. That's justice. The problem with justice is that one person wins. You have a winner and a loser, you pack your bags and you go away. And the loser's condemned. But in this situation, where we have conflict in the teams that we work with, the person's not going to go away. They're still going to be there. You're going to have to work with this person again. And of course, there's leave. Which is what we did. We negotiated an exit. And the problem with that is that those that were hurt will still hurt. And you just pack up and leave. And you look for that way out. And it's a hurt that I carry for a long time. For about two years I've been thinking about this. And the first time I gave a talk, this talk, a variation of this talk, was in 2010, after I had a chance to digest this. And it was, a, it was not in South Africa, it was in Sweden. <coughs> Cut the talk short because it was far too emotional. Where do I go wrong? Something I've been asking myself. And Bob Marley is one of my favorite musicians. I wonder what he would have said about life today. Stop <coughs> yellow there. Though I know it's impossible to go living through the past, I have to look at the past, but I can't live through the past. I have to live in the present. But there's answers there. And that reality check in 2006, 2002, 2008, I missed the trick. Because 10 years before that, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That's retrospectives at scale. What are you guys fussing about? <laughs> what don't you get? That's retrospectives at scale. That's a meaning, man. You know, with all its criticisms, what that gave us was very literally the truth shall set you free. Nothing else. It was an acknowledgement. It may not have healed an entire nation, but it healed individuals because for the first time, someone had closure about what happened to them or their family member, etc. And those were atrocities that were, that were committed from both sides of the war. And in the conflicts that we talk about in our teams, no matter how trivial or how serious they are, even in the tragic project I work in, we never spoke the truth. We tried to find and gloss over other things. Because it's too painful to face the truth. So these architects and adversaries of ours were also peacemakers. You know, it's a crazy thing that in a society so full of violence, 
and tragedy, we have four Nobel Peace Laureates. This is ironic. Now, all of that emerges people who can actually change society. And we acknowledge for that. And so when I think about it, that first phase of our history, the three guys at the top, that's contempt, that's apartheid. Contempt is us and them. I scorn you. That's what it is. You know, a developer who has contempt for a, for a tester, that's, that's nonsense. That's contempt, it's us and them. You know, management to development, same thing. It's an individual goal. And you don't need to do anything else because it's just slavery. There's no integrity involved there. However, at that stage, with those two guys, it was cooperation. And I'm using the word cooperation deliberately because I don't know how I'll make distinction between that idea and that of collaboration, which I want to talk about as well. They shared a goal, and that's working on integrity. To the integrity of individuals, the integrity of the collective. <clears throat> but sharing a goal, it's no different than me calling it self organization because we gather together to fulfill an objective, which is the same as me organizing an electrician and a plumber to make sure you are actually there at the right time and you get the job done so I can have a kitchen. It's the same thing. But what about this collaboration? There must be more to it than just sharing a goal. Because in the project that I worked in, we shared a goal, yet we suffered, and we failed, and we grew up. There must be something more to that. The history of society, whether it's South Africa, Africa, or any part of the world, is that we've been subjected to sublimate bondage, but yet we can't organize, even under the most trying of circumstances, we can't organize ourselves. We don't need freedom to organize. Under the right circumstances, we will band it together and sort things out. You don't need permission, you just do it. Why is that? And I think what this teacher who said this about the truth and reconciliation commission, and that is that we're all losers, right? And there's, there's something there about integrity and identity which resonated with me. And with that integrity and identity is something that I want to talk about a little bit more. There's this thing that Albert Petrie said, from the beginning of history, our history, has been one of the ascending unities, the breaking of creedal barriers. So, in 1994, we had integrity. It was a cooperative solution to the, to the problems that we faced. And a lot of the teams that we work with, we start off by trying to establish integrity. I look at integrity as the sum of our trust as a whole. And every action carries a payload called trust. You either break it or you amplify it. And I talk nothing about identity, and that is the sum of our value. Things that we believe and share collectively. And what we've been trying to do is this journey of the same unities to go beyond cooperation, go beyond integrity, to a point of identity. Which is why this event is so important for us in Africa. Amongst these peacemakers, there's also identity builders. You know, Nelson Mandela said, and some of you have read my blog or heard me talk about this. I talk about Ubuntu quite a lot. And Ubuntu does not mean that people should not address themselves. The question, therefore, is are you going to do so in order to enable the community around you to be able to improve? What am I going to do so that we're all improve? That's a serious question. So even in a team, when we went to moan and groan and go home and complain and have retrospectives, that's what we focus on. That is what we should be focusing on. And Steve Biko, it becomes more necessary to see the truth as it is. If you realize that the only vehicle for change are these people who have lost their personality, people who have lost their identity, become the vehicle for change, because you're trying to reclaim that identity. So, when you work with contempt, there's an individual goal and no integrity. With cooperation, we focus focusing on preserving a goal, but we're working on building up our trust, our integrity. You can rely upon me, that's what it means. But with collaboration, we're preserving our integrity, we're preserving our trust, and we're working on identity. That's what we're after. So, 
Nurturing identities cannot be time boxed. You can't time box this. It's, it's something that we've just carried on doing for a long time. It's not about you know, creating a identity, it's not about giving a team a name. It, it feels like such a feeble thing when we, you know, agile startup, let's form teams, let's pick a name. Maybe it's from the Star Wars theme or Star Trek, depending which way you are. <laughs> and then go to some website and find caricatures of yourself and stick them on the door or above your desk. <laughs> hey, we're a team. You know, that's not a team, that's tribalism. <laughs> it really is, it's nothing more. If you want to really collaborate, you have to give, you have to nurture this thing called identity. You know, it's not about following a common process either. Following process is important. It makes us work in a particular way. But that's also ritualism. What we're really after is about sharing our ideology and talking about our ideology all the time. That's what we believe, regardless of the rituals that we follow. I can tell you for a fact, when we were part of the mass democratic movement, we did not bring down apartheid by chasing sticky notes on the board until it's done. <laughs> None of that. Not because we couldn't afford sticky notes, but we weren't invented then. Seriously, you don't create a revolution by chasing sticky notes. Post-its. Although Karen here will put them on foreheads and make everyone else do that. It's a different story. It's not about team-based decisions, because that's just controlling production. No, we'll do this, no, we won't do this, and we'll decide when we want to do this. It's not about that. It's as a team being held accountable for your decisions, because when you're held accountable for your decisions, it's about the only thing that we challenge your shared values. That's the time when we challenge it. It's the accountability after being given responsibility. That forces us to share and build an identity. You know, this thing about the lean startups, which is really, really great material for highly mature teams. And so we use this word pivoting a lot, which is, hey, switch direction, you know, pivot 180 and go in another direction. Generally, it's described in, in, in the context of reacting to market demand. We try that, didn't work, let's try that. And that's funny, okay? But we also want to pivot to test our beliefs. If you're going to change direction, question your belief again. Question your ideology. You know. But it's also okay if you just want to pivot on a woman. Hey, let's just try that instead. That's fine. No big deal. It doesn't mean that every pivot has to be a philosophical discussion. It's also not about democracy and teams building identities because of the danger of democracy prints at us and them and the minority get trampled. There is danger in that. But it's about the diminishing of class differences. Architect and developer. Who gets the seat higher? Okay. It's that definition of class response, class defense. And it's about equal appreciation of specialized skills. We talk about cross functional teams, but it's the appreciation of the skill that someone brings to the workforce that we're really after. That appreciation helps us install identity. So to grow identities, you have to have, I believe, a complete clash of value systems. Mine against yours, yours against others, and somewhere in that, something will take hold. But you can't just expect it to happen. You have to encourage that debate and discussion, and it's a low priority thread that runs through the team, through the team all the time, constantly. Questioning identity, questioning ideology, questioning philosophy what we believe in and what we're after. But it's really, really painful. That's why I put that part of national mystic up. Many more will have to suffer. Some will leave, some will die. That's okay. You don't believe in your ideology. We're not talking about converting. We're talking about aggregating and following. So beyond apartheid and democracy, this slide I put up just for Chris last night. Because he said it's about politics. So agile software development. We talk about all the things that the team must do. It reminds me of worker centric socialism, Chris. <laughs> so, and it makes me wonder, and I don't want to answer this question now, it's just being there for Chris's sake, and so if you disagree, it's fine. I don't know whether I believe this or not. I wonder why agile transformations are difficult. Perhaps 
the worker centric socialist elements of agile software development clash with the work of free market economies and companies in which work. So that's my political pitch. <laughs> However, I am reminded more strongly that in every class struggle, in every struggle that we try to bring about the change of society, there are strong socialist elements in it. So, if you're fearful of this word socialist because it's quite close to communist, read up a little bit more about what we mean by socialism. It is about the authentic way of bringing about change. And what does it mean to be an agile software team in Africa? What does it mean? You know, over the centuries, 1600 to 1900, here in South Africa and other parts of Africa, it's been the eradication of identities. That's all it does. Apartheid, colonialism, neocolonialism is the eradication of identities. As the human species, we are masters of extinction. Given an opportunity, we will extinguish an identity. It's happened all over the world at various times in our history as the human race. It's not, it's not like it's not going to happen again. But what I'm after to be an African software developer on this continent is the restoration and creation of an African identity. I'm not talking about black or white. I'm not talking about Strum versus Kanban versus Lee. I'm talking about us building an identity. I'm not going to talk about an identity for all of us. An identity in our teams. And I think if we can achieve that nurturing of identity in our teams, in ourselves, I think we're actually moving forward in a big, big way. And so, that's what it means to me, to be collaborative with nurturing identity. And I know this talk has been really at quite a philosophical level in many ways. But I'd like you to go back and think about your own life. Share your stories. Martin is up after me. Knows I encourage you to share stories. So if I have the courage to share my story, I have the courage to share your story, even if it's just a new team. <coughs> and because we're in the tip of Africa, I'm going to reach up high to Ghana and tell you this is what it means to be in Africa. We face neither east nor west, we face forward. Forming. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>